This morning, we have the good fortune of 2 Corinthians, and we have 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We'd love to put one in your hands as we go through the text together. But um, as it's been a couple of weeks since we've um, been in 2 Corinthians, perhaps a couple of uh, just reminders or refreshes for you as we get there in our Bibles. Um, 2 Corinthians obviously was written by Paul, much like 1 Corinthians. Uh, the church in Corinth was probably planted um, on the second missionary journey. 1 Corinthians was probably written in 55 AD. Second was probably late 55, certainly maybe 56 AD. And so um, Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, and they've had all sorts of problems, which he answered in the first letter, and then uh, he hears that the problems persist, and so he makes a visit, a severe visit perhaps, um, between the two letters, and then uh, it seems like the people seem to respond a little bit, and then, of course, somewhere along the line, we get this one not too long after that, Second Corinthians being written to the church. And so there's a ton of biographical information. By that we mean there's a ton of information that Paul shares about himself, his plans in the early parts of Second Corinthians chapters, the, the early chapters of Second Corinthians, and then, of course, uh, towards excuse me, towards the middle, he, he deals with the subject of giving and the church is collecting giving, and of course he ends his letter too. So that's basically just a real quick two-second outline of, first, of Second Corinthians. Uh, to give you an idea of where we're going in Second Corinthians chapter 4, of course, verses 1 through 4, you'll notice he's going to be talking about this ministers and ministers of the new covenant, and what a wonderful thing that is. Um, then he talks in verses fifteen through uh, 5 through 15, he talks about the difficulties in ministry, and the difficulties in his apostleship. Um, as you will notice as we go through Second Corinthians together, you'll see that um, there's a really great um, defense, in a sense, of Paul's apostolic min ministry in Second Corinthians as a whole. And certainly you'll see a little bit of it here, but more so in other places of the text. And of course, verses 16 through 18, where we will hopefully be finishing off this morning, Paul would remind us to keep an eye on the things which are not seen. Keep an eye on the eternal perspective. So um, some really, really good encouraging nuggets in there for you. And uh, before we begin, why don't I pray over our time and ask the Lord to lead us and to guide us in his word. Lord, we do love you. And we do praise you for all you've done for us. We thank you that you are gracious to us. Holy Spirit, the one who so allowed these letters, letters to be written, uh, would you open our eyes to see the truths that you would have for us? Would you allow us to be led of you this morning? Would you be our teacher this morning, Lord? And would you lead us and guide us as we think through this text and as we consider what incredible applications it has for us today in Williamsburg, Virginia? So Lord, hear us tell you we do love you and uh, hear us tell you that we do ask you to speak to us. Um, would you put your, heart, your word on our hearts exactly where we need to hear it? For it's in Jesus' name that we do pray and we do ask. Amen. Well, um, that, I, I gave you a quick outline of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, so if, without further ado, why don't we get into 2 Corinthians 4, shall we? Verses 1 through 4, I read from the New American Standard. But feel free to follow along in whatever text you have before you. He says this, Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy... We do not lose heart, but as we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterate, adulterating the word of God, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We'll stop there for a quick second, shall we? Of course, you'll notice there in verse 1, he says, Therefore, tying back to 2 Corinthians, obviously, chapter 3. And one of the things he was talking about in chapter 3, we were beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed as we behold into this glory or into this mirror, so to speak. But the other thing he talks about is this new covenant that we're in. Moses had the old covenant, brought the old covenant, and there's a sense there in verse 6 of chapter 3. He says, who made us also adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. So Paul is referencing the, that there was that old covenant. There is now that, this new covenant. And this new covenant distinguished, in a sense, by the spirit. For the letter kills there in verse 6, 
but the Spirit gives life. So he's been talking about this new covenant, and therefore he says here in verse 1, therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry is he talking about? The ministry of the new covenant. Paul, just like the apostles, was under this new covenant, as we are today, brethren. Yes, we are a little bit down the line, but we are part of this new covenant. Paul was a minister. We have this ministry, this ministry of what? The new covenant, the covenant of grace, often it's referred to as the covenant of the blood of Jesus, or ratified by the blood of Jesus. And of course, as we celebrate communion this morning, we will consider that too. We have this ministry. We have received, as we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. It's a wonderful new covenant that we're a part of. The offer, of, the offer or the invitation to salvation is, is open to everyone, to anyone who would believe. There is grace enough for absolutely any one of us. Of course, here we see that Paul certainly understands this incredible privilege. We have this ministry, this new covenant ministry, and therefore he says there, we do not lose heart. Brethren, I know we all got hard things going on in our lives, do we not? The Apostle, certainly, the Apostle Paul certainly had some difficult things going on. Second Corinthians documents just some of those, and we'll touch on them perhaps a little later in our time. But we do not lose heart. Why? Because we are part of this wonderful new covenant that has eternal promise. It has benefits for us now in the sense that we can be forgiven for our sin. We have benefit now in the sense that the Spirit does come to dwell in our hearts. And we have this future hope secure in Christ. So we do not lose heart, he tells them. But we've renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating. Verse 2 really tells us how he conducts his ministry, if you will. Notice the first three, three things he tells us of how he doesn't conduct his ministry. We've renounced the things of hidden shame, or perhaps I could phrase it this way, those things which would be considered disgraceful. We've renounced those disgraceful things in our ministry. We have nothing to do with that. We're not walking in craftiness, whereas the um, King, James, New, New King, ja oh, King James also says craftiness. ESV says underhanded. We've renounced those. We've left those things. He also says that we have not been adulterating the Word of God um, we have not tampered with the Word of God. We've, in the sense, not messed with it. We've brought it to you as it is. Manifestation of the truth there, notice in verse 3, this is, uh, in verse 2, this is how we've conducted ourselves in the ministry, but by manifestation of the truth. That is to say, we've not used underhanded ways of presenting the good news to you. We've not presented or used any deceitful means in bringing the good news to you. What we have done is we've presented the truth to you and we've left it as it is. You know one of my roles as a minister or as the minister standing in for this morning? Americans, I'm well aware, like bacon and eggs for breakfast. I will borrow this analogy from John Stott. John Stott says it, 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 it's really for the guy who's sharing or teaching his job is not, if, if the master has provided for you bacon and eggs, my job is not to give you just the bacon, because I know you like bacon. My job is not to do this either. My job is not to give you bacon, eggs, and sausage. That's not what the master has provided. I'm not to add to what's been given. I'm simply to give you what the master has provided, bacon and eggs. That's what you get. So hopefully as you sit under this ministry at this church, that's what you get. We're not here to add anything to the scriptures. We're certainly not here to take away anything but we're here to present the truth to you. And of course, brethren, the truth is fundamentally important to us today. Fundamentally important to us today as believers in Jesus because there's this idea out there that truth has become very relative and what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. But brethren, the Bible would speak differently over that, would it not? Jesus says, come to me all who are weary... Um, Excuse me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth by its nature is what we call transcultural. Matter of fact, we were sitting here on Friday night with the youth group discussing the nature of truth in a way. It's transcultural, which basically means whether you live in India or you live in Africa or you live in America, it's still the same Jesus who saves you. He's still the same one that you need to put your faith in. 
The Bible is not just presenting to us a way of salvation as, an, as a way, but truly it's presenting to us the way of salvation, the only way that we can be saved. It's not presenting to us just some facts, but it's presenting to us a worldview. And so you and I, as we live in this milieu of ideas, this whole sea of ideas that are out there in this world that we live in, the Bible would say to us, cultivate a biblical worldview. See the world the way God sees it. Everything was created good, it's fallen because of sin, and now it's on that place or that train of thought of redemption. So, of course, he says there, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. He says, listen, you're more than welcome to judge us. Every man's conscience, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. You're more than welcome to do so, especially if you would like to judge us in the sight of God, because ain't no hiding anything from him. He sees everything. In verse 3. Hopefully, again, uh, hopefully again as, as, as for, I know some of you are visitors in this room, um, but hopefully if, if you sit in here for a long enough time, for those of you who've been around, that would be our hope. That would be our heart in this ministry, whether you sit in this room, whether you teach the kids, or whatever else you do, that the truth would be presented. Verse 3, he seems to talk about those who are unbelievers. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing veiled or blocked, in a sense. Maybe you could think about it that way. The gospel is veiled. Is the gospel going forth? Yes, but some people are not being saved. Why not? Why? Well, there's a veil. There's a blockage, so to speak. It's closed off from understanding, from people's understanding. Um, notice, if you will, in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 3, but their minds were hardened for until this very day. At the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains, unlifted, because it is only removed in Christ. But to, this, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Of course, that passage in chapter 3, talking about the Jews who go and listen to the Old Covenant or the Old Testament being read, and they don't quite understand all that's going on. Why? Why don't they understand? Because they have yet to put their faith in Jesus. And as they put their faith in Jesus, who is not just a man, but the Messiah, the anointed deliverer, they will understand because that veil will be removed. Uh, perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you go, you know what, as I read the Bible and as I look at the things of God, I, I find it very difficult to understand it. Matter of fact, it's like Chinese to me and I don't speak Chinese. I don't get it. Perhaps, brethren, this might be your same problem. Unless you ask the Lord into your heart, unless you um, open that door, so to speak, there's a sense in which that veil is still covering your face. It's still covering your eyes. You cannot see Jesus for who he really is until you yield your life to him. So if the things of God to you are so foreign to you that you don't understand them, perhaps this is your quandary right over here. And of course, the scriptures would always tell us today's the day of salvation. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, the person who doesn't have the spirit can't understand the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned. So Paul here in verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Of course, here in reference to Satan, the God of this world, there's, uh, as we look around the world, there's no doubt that he has uh, an incredible influence over this world. It's not to say that God has somehow stepped off the throne, far from it, but there is a sense in which this worldly system that exists apart from God is under his domain, is under his control, and he is propagating things that are untrue against the things of God. Uh, you can re I'll reference here really quickly for you. Ephesians 2, 2, which you can look up on your own, um, or 2 Timothy 2, 26. You can look that one up on your own. But I'll give you just one of these here that we can read together. 1 John 5, verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There's a sense in which this worldly system that exists apart from God is under his control. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. 
so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The unbelieving haven't been able to see this brilliance of who Jesus really is. He is the image of God, the light of the gospel, who is the image of God. Man, brethren, aren't we happy? Aren't we blessed? Aren't we so aware that there is hope, that there is a way for man to be made right with God? It could have been that perhaps there was no way, but God in his graciousness has allowed there to be a way. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it or overthrow it, says, in, as in reference to John chapter 1. There is a way for us to be made right with God, and that is truly through the gospel. I'll give you another text here, um, Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Perhaps a little illustration, if you will, uh, borrowed from Kierkegaard, if I'm not mistaken. The gospel is good news. That's really what it is. Um, it would be, you'd be hard-pressed for us to imagine we turn on the news this evening and uh, the, the, the news anchor goes, I got some news for you, but I'm not going to share it. Of course, the gospel is news. It's good news, and good news obviously is to be shared, is it not? And it's good news that men and women, regardless of race, regardless of where they live, can be made right with God. So it is good news. And it's, of course, centered very principally on the person of Jesus and what he did on the cross. Kierkegaard gives this uh, illustration. Perhaps it will help you. There was a king, and uh, this king was obviously very powerful and wealthy or whatever. And uh, lo and behold, he was walking through the streets one day, and he sees a beautiful maiden. But she's poor. He's the king. She's poor. And he thinks, ah, I would love to marry this girl. How can I win her heart? If I, if I just go up to her now and say, hey, you need to marry me, she might be forced into this relationship with me. So he decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take my kingly robes. Let me put them to one side. Let me dress up as a beggar. Let me go and talk to her and see if I can't win her heart that way. That way I know her affection will be genuine. And so, of course, this king does that. And, of course, this king does go to this maiden. And, of course, he does try to win her heart. Is that not what Jesus does for us, brethren? He is this great king. We are that poor maiden. Yet, rather than force his will upon us, he came clothed in humanity just like us, took on our very frailties without sin. And so, brethren, I tell you today, If there's one person who knows what it's like to deal with difficulty, if there's one person you can always go to, I'd like to think I could help you. But ultimately, Jesus. Jesus is the one who you can go to because probably we know Joseph died when he was very young. We know Jesus came from a, probably a very poor family. We know he experienced hardship and difficulty, sorrow. He cried when Lazarus died. If there's one person that you can go to who will truly understand, surely it's him. So there is a way for men to be made right, and of course, it is in Jesus. But perhaps a couple of nuggets that I can give you to take away from just a couple of these verses here. Surely in our evangelism, then, it says there in verse 3, of course, and even if our gospel it is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Um, I'm well aware that many of us in this room are believers, and there was obviously there's some folks on our hearts and minds that we're praying for, maybe families or friends, that haven't quite received the gospel. Perhaps we could pray this for them, that God would remove that veil, that they would be able to see the goodness of the gospel. Perhaps that that name is already on the tip of your tongue. It's already come to your mind. It's that person, Lord. Well, perhaps before we, we end here today, we might pray for that person that's on your heart, that they might see the gospel and see Jesus for who he really is. I think also, surely, that takes a bit of pressure off of us, right? I mean, we have this gospel, it's good news, we share it, and uh, we allow the Lord, in a sense, to do his work. The battle truly is not ours, but, not, but the Lord's. And perhaps one last thing that I would like to give you here as uh, uh, some handles, perhaps, to, to put this to your life. 
Um, there's a sense in which um, I, I was listening to the sermon by, by John MacArthur, and, and he was talking a little bit about this text a couple of days ago. And one of the things he talks about here is the glory of the gospel, um, the glory of Christ. And what a wonderful thing that gospel is, that it is, such this, it is this incredible treasure that there's a sense in which Paul having gone through all this incredible stuff, and, and, and you'll see some of the ordeals he goes through in, in chapter 6, afflictions, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, sleeplessness, hunger, all these things. Why? Because there's a sense in which Paul has seen this incredible beauty, this incredible truth of who God is in the person of Jesus, and so he's able to endure these incredibly difficult things. And so... We'll leave it at that for, that for the minute there. Why don't we pick up verses 5 through 7 together. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. For we do not preach ourselves. Of course, Paul, incredible minister of the gospel that he was, wasn't there for self he wasn't there for his own ends. Truly, he was there for the Lord. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus, not just Christ Jesus, but Christ Jesus as Lord. The Lordship of Jesus, not over some of your life, but over all of your life and our lives too. And for Jesus and, and ourselves as your bond servants. One of the roles of ministers or leaders in the church, there's no way to read the New Testament and not see this. But one of our roles as those of us who get to lead is your servants. Paul says there, and us, your servants, your bond servants. And it's not that we serve you because we're such nice people. In a sense, we serve you for Jesus' sake because we see the bigger picture of what's going on here. Verse 6 tells us, for God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness. You're probably thinking, ah, that sounds a little bit familiar. And you'd be right. It is a little bit familiar. Of course, because it comes from the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 verse 3, let there be light. So this is a bit of an echo here, and Paul is drawing a comparison between the creation that happened in Genesis 1, let there be light, and all that God created, and us getting saved. There's a comparison going on. Just as God had that supernatural power to bring things out of nothing, creation ex nihilo, which means creation out of nothing, so there's a sense in which he has this power to shine this light in our hearts. It is God who shone this um, light in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It was God who had to shine his light into our hearts, and then we apprehended and saw this knowledge. Ah, Jesus is more than just a carpenter. And a knowledge of the glory of God, and it was in the face of Christ. Why don't we pick up verses 7 through 15 together here. There's, um, I'm sure there'll be a couple of verses in here that you will we'll truly be encouraged by. But we'll pick up these rather lengthy verses together here. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that, life, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and present us with him or present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Quite a chunk of text there, and I'll see if I can help you walk or help us walk through this together. But we have this treasure in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. Um, why don't we start with treasure? Treasure, of course, in reference to the gospel. We have this incredible 
truth, this incredible, incredibly valuable thing, um, worth more than anything money could buy. We have this treasure, not just Paul and them. He had that treasure. He passed it on. We too, believers in Jesus, have this treasure. And he says that we have it in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels, some of your translations might say clay pots or jars of clay. There was a Christian band called Jars of Clay in reference to this text, obviously. But the idea is of a common pot, right? There was just a common pot used in the household for various items, sometimes to store valuables or whatever, sometimes for more mundane things, taking out trash and the like. We have these clay pots. You and I are the clay pots. Earthen vessels, a common image in his day. And here's the glorious thing. Those clay pots hold this incredible treasure. You and I, those clay pots, hold this incredible truth of the gospel. The other, obviously, the apostles, other believers, filled with this incredible treasure. I came across this story um, in Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you have read it. It's probably in Jesus Freaks as well or somewhere along the line. But in one of those kinds of books, I don't know if some of you have read it. There's, there's certainly a devotional out there which goes through some of these stories that uh, believers across the world have gone through in, in uh, different times and different ages. But there's this one about this guy who was forced to serve in a Soviet like camp or hard labor camp or something like that. And this guy... Uh, for whatever season or time it was, he was, he was in this place, and uh, obviously the labor was hard, and, and the people administrate, uh, administering over the camp weren't very gracious or kind. But one day he was involved in an accident, and uh, I, I, think, I think they were working underground or something like that. They were involved in this accident, and it damaged his back to the point that he became a hunchback after that. And so one day he was walking around or whatever, and uh, this little kid says, hey, what happened to you? Or what are you? And the guy says, oh, well, like, I, I guess I'm a hunchback. And the guy was expecting the kid to, you know, joke or uh, say something incredibly insensitive. And uh, the young kid basically says to this guy, you know, God doesn't make deformities. There's a sense in which you are carrying this incredibly precious box. And in that box are angels' wings. And one day... Jesus is going to take you to be with him or that kind of thing. And the guy, I think, just, he just had to shed a tear at that. You and I are those clay vessels, those clay pots, and we have this incredible treasure within us. And regardless of what you look like or what may have happened, if you have the gospel, you still have that incredible treasure in you. It's incredibly good news. It cannot be taken away from you no matter what happens to the body. So we have this incredible uh, treasure in earthen ve vessels. And there verse 7 tells us, so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God will be of God and not from ourselves. Why does God do it this way? So that it's plainly obvious to everyone that it's not of us. There was, a, uh, there was a, one pastor that um, used to lead us when I was back in college. His name was Dwayne Carson. But uh, he had this one, I guess he got it from a book, actually. I, I, guess it, I think it might even be a title from a book, or well, certainly a quote from a book. And uh, one of the things, it, it would say, it, it went like this here. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. Like I said, I think he borrowed it from a book. Um, the point of that little nugget is just to, to say to your brethren, we didn't get here by ourselves. Yeah? Why did God do it this way? Why did God use weaknesses and these kinds of things to show everyone that it wasn't of us? So that this passing greatness of his power will, will be known of God. Verses 8 and 9 he uses four images there. We're afflicted in every way. Just, you know, if you can imagine that pot under scrutiny from the outside. Perplexed, persecuted, but not forsaken. Just a quick word on verse 9. Persecuted, well known, of course, that those Jesus even said in John 15, if they persecuted me. If they love me, they will love you. If they hated me, they will hate you. The early church certainly experienced that. Eleven of the twelve apostles were certainly persecuted to the point of death but not forsaken, struck down, perhaps a wrestling image where a guy gets shoved down, but not destroyed. 
but always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. Even though these things are happening on the outside, on the inside, the new man that has been created in us by Christ is still there so that the life of Jesus may be manifested. Verse 11, for we are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. And Paul, well aware with, with, with all these difficulties um, that he's faced, 2 Corinthians 11 goes into some of the difficulties he faced, was well aware of all these difficulties, but there was a sense in which he still kept the big picture. He could still see what, was, what God was doing through those difficult tribulations and painful things that happened. Persecutions, labors, he talks about, imprisonments, beatings, uh, lashes, beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked. All these things happened, yet he was still able to maintain this view that God was doing something in it and through it for the glory of God. Verse, um, so death works in us in verse 12, but life in you. Regardless of what happened, the gospel still went forth. And because the gospel still went forth, life still goes forth. We are just a little bit down the train of that. But verse 13, but we having the same spirit of faith according to what is written. Of course, this is a reference here, if you will, to Psalm 116, which is actually a thanksgiving psalm. And the psalmist in 100, Psalm 116 starts off in this place of incredible difficulty. But by, he, by the time he gets to the middle of the psalm, he says, I believed and therefore I spoke. And then towards the end of the psalm, he gets to a, a sort of thanksgiving, if you will. The psalmist was showing an incredible faith that regardless of what was going on, there was hope because God was in the situation. It's the same thing Paul is saying here, the same spirit of faith, not the Holy Spirit, but that same kind of faith that that psalmist had to put faith in God, even when things were going awry, I believed and therefore I spoke. We believe, therefore we also speak. So there's a sense in which Paul was emulating that psalmist. In a time of difficulty, still putting his faith in God, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up with you also. Um, verse 14 is key in so, in so many ways. In some of the things that it says, knowing that he who raised Jesus will raise us. <sighs> knowing he who raised Jesus. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 is, is an incredible passage. And uh, for those of you who were with us, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, the scriptures make clear to us that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that's really, really uh, a hugely, a hugely, hugely important thing, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Not just spiritually raised from the dead, but literally raised from the dead. That's to say he was dead. There was no heartbeat. There was nothing going on. He was dead, dead, dead but he was raised to life by God. And that has incredible, incredible implications for you and I as believers. Uh, incredible implications. Because it, it shows us if Jesus was actually raised from the dead, that we can be forgiven of our sins. It shows us that our Christian hope is actually fixed. It shows us that if Jesus was raised from the dead, guess what's going to happen to us too? We're also going to be raised from the dead. But brethren, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, you and I have a serious problem. Our faith is in vain. And so it's fundamentally important. It's hugely, it's massively, it's wonderfully, bigly important that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because if he wasn't, we're in big trouble. And here's the deal, friends. Each of us goes through these things called doubts. We took a little poll in the youth group, and, and one of the questions I think was, towards this issue of doubt. I mean, we all have doubts over things. But what do you do when these doubts or people ask you questions to which you don't really know the answer to? Why do you believe Jesus? Why do you have this faith? Listen, look back and if you need to listen to what Brian Horner shared the last couple of weeks, he gave us some reasons to believe. One of the reasons that I will tell you, that I will give to you, that I think about when I have... What about this? What about that? Who is Jesus? How do we know this actually happened? It's the resurrection. It's the resurrection. Because even if you take just the New Testament as it is, the story, the, the what happened, and you just take them at face value, he was crucified, fact. 
Christians have said it, non-Christians have said it, Brian Horner pointed that out, I'm sure. He was crucified, he did die. The apostles genuinely had appearances of him. It didn't just happen in the secret place, there was plenty of people who witnessed this. Those apostles' lives were changed completely in a sense and were willing to go with that thought till death. Brethren, there is good, good, good reasons to believe Jesus rose from the dead. And if he did rise from the dead, we're in a good place because that means our faith is not in vain. There are good reasons to believe Jesus rose from the dead. And there, though there are incredible implications, as I mentioned a couple, um, because he raised from the dead. Verse, uh, at the end of verse 14 there, he says, um, and, and Jesus will raise us with you as well. So, of course, Paul is referencing the fact that believers, whether you're just in the laity or the apostles, everyone will be raised if they have that faith in Jesus. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks. Why don't we pick up here verses um, 16 through 18 together. Um, I think one of the things that we can talk about here in these last few verses is quite simply this. There's an eternal perspective. There's a bigger picture going on, and we will see it here in verses 16 through 18, that regardless of what's going on in our lives at the moment, Paul would admonish us to look beyond what is happening in the here and now to what will become. Therefore, in verse 16, it says, We do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal course there he says therefore in verse 16 knowing who the glory belongs to knowing to Jesus that Jesus was raised and that we too will be raised knowing this truth hopefully should transform the way we think about things the way we do things the way we do life we don't lose heart knowing that we are ministers of this new covenant knowing that there is this incredible hope knowing that Jesus was raised knowing that we too will be raised we don't lose heart. Um, I remember the, when I was in college, um, the chancellor at that time, he, he got up, and I, I guess he knew us students well enough at that point that there were certain points in the semester where people would get this point where they would hit this point where they would go, I quit, I give up, I'm done, I can't do any more school. And uh, I think when I look back on my college days, one of the things I think about, I go, oh my gosh. Or, or one of the things I realized was, you know what, listen, if I miss a paper, if I miss a deadline, if I flunk an exam or something, what's the worst that can happen? All right, fine, it's a, it's a bad grade, it'll mar my GPA, this, that, and the other. I'm thinking, I mean, that's pretty bad, but I, I, I was looking forward and thinking, what if I missed a house payment? That's a whole lot worse. And so I used to comfort myself with that, like, oh, okay, this, as bad as this is, the problems could be a whole lot worse. And so one of the t every so often, I guess Jerry Falwell would do this. I'm sure he probably did many times. But he would get up there and he would say something like this. Don't quit. I don't know what it is you're dealing with this morning, brethren, whether it's at home, at work, family, whatever else it might include. Don't quit. Don't give up. Um, it's always too soon to give up. Always too soon. And, and he would give us that message, and it was, in so many ways, it was such a timely message. And I think it's a timely message for us today, too, because there's many things that are probably discouraging us from one end of the spectrum to another. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep going. These momentary light things, don't lose heart. There is something bigger happening here. We don't give up. We don't lose focus on what is coming. Because 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that there is a judgment seat of Christ coming for believers. And there will be like these rewards dispensed on that day. Don't give up. 
Keep going. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. There's still hope. Jesus is still alive. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is growing stronger. I was talking to one, one of the sisters who was going through an incredibly difficult time, and uh, this is one of the verses that I thought about with her. I was like, you're facing all these things, this and that and this and that and all these other things on top of each other. But there was a sense in which even though that outer man was decaying, that is to say, even though we are getting older, that inner man in us is still being renewed. It is still growing more and more like Jesus. Ephesians 4.24 says, And put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Or Colossians 3.10, And put on that new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Yes, the outer man is decaying. Yes, we are getting older. Yes, the law of second thermodynamics or whatever it's called, the entropic principle is at work. Yes, but the inner man is still growing stronger. And so we keep feeding that lion. We keep feeding that dog. Verse 17, he talks about these momentary light afflictions, temporal difficulties, things that will, have, that will come to an end. Um, there was one kid when I was in college. I, I was in a bit of a bind. I think I needed to get a paper in or something, and I was a little bit behind the eight ball. And uh, his words to me was, it was like midnight, so you know it's not good at that point already. But he says to me, hey, Donnie, good news. This too shall pass. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> not quite what I wanted to hear at that moment. So I don't say to you in that heart or in that manner of speaking because I'm well aware that pain and difficulty aren't one that we can just take the broom to and go, there you go, it's done with. But don't lose heart. Keep, keep putting that foot in front of the other. When you don't know what to do next, do the next thing. I think that was Amy Carmichael. Elizabeth Elliot, I'm sorry. Our momentary light afflictions, these things have a temporalness to us, but there's a sense in which, verse 17, this affliction produces something far greater, this eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. Um, for those of you who travel to different countries, you know that there's different currencies, and different currencies have different exchange rates. And I lived in a country where we had multiple exchange rates at different times, but I'll give you a simple illustration of it really quickly just to show you. If you have $10 and you wanted to buy another currency and imagine the bank just said, listen, we're going to triple your money, man. We're going to give you way more than what it's worth. Of course, you and I would all go, hey, I'm, I like that deal. I'm cashing in. There's a sense in which, brethren, that's exactly what's going on here in our Christian lives. Yes, there are difficult things going on. Yes, we have to fight the good fight of faith. Yes, it's difficult. But the exchange rate is really in our favor. It's really in our favor. That judgment seat of Christ, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. It will be worth it. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Look not at the things which are unseen, but the things which are unseen in verse 18. Look to the one who is eternal. Look to the one who has the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives, as that old famous song says. So if we can, why don't we close out this time of uh, scriptural education, if you will, uh, admonishment, encouragement. It's always too soon to give up. Always too soon to give up. Don't quit. If the Lord has brought you to some situation, if the Lord has given you some opportunity, don't give up on it. When he's ready to close the door, he will. Don't give up. Don't quit because you're not getting your way. Don't quit because it's hard. Don't quit because you're feeling unappreciated. If the Lord has called you to it, stick with it. He's opened the door. Stick with it until he's closed that door for you. Leave. When you leave that place, you leave in a sense of peace because you know he opened the door and you know he's going to close the door. Brethren, on that note, why don't, we get to, why don't we celebrate this, um, this wonderful Christian rite we call 
the Lord's Supper or communion together. So if we could have the, the gentlemen, the ushers, just to come forward with us. Communion is such a wonderful thing, and uh, it's such an opportunity for us as believers to think back again over what Jesus has done for us and uh, consider what strength it might even give us today. For those of you who maybe haven't put your faith in Christ, I would admonish you to perhaps not partake of this because as a believer, you and I are remembering something that actually happened, right? We're remembering Jesus didn't just get nicked for our wounds. He died. He had to die. He couldn't just drop a couple of drops of blood and that was it. No, he had to die for our sins. Such was the seriousness of our sin. And so for those of you who haven't yet put your faith in Christ, there's a sense in which you don't quite understand what this is in reference to. But for those of you who have put your faith in Christ, you do know. You do know that Jesus wasn't just nicked for our wounds. That lamb wasn't just cut on the leg and set free. No, that lamb had to die. It had to die. For the wages of sin is death, indeed. Something had to die, and the blood of bulls and goats could never cleanse our evil consciences. Could never. It needed something far greater. So as we, be, uh, before the guys give this out, I, I'd like for us just to let that truth soak in our hearts a little bit here. And for those of you, like I say, who haven't put your faith in Christ, perhaps today would be the day that you do that. That you do see that there is something that God can make out of your life. So why don't we give this two seconds just to meditate on this truth, and then um, the guys will hand out the elements. Um,
Well, brethren, why don't we uh, pray over these elements together and uh, let's be reminded that it was, it's good news. It's good news for us because otherwise we would have to, to pay this penalty on our own and the truth is we could never. Lord, we tell you we do love you, not because uh, of anything that we've done, because you first loved us and how tangibly you showed your love to us. Greater love has no one, Lord, than to lay down their lives for someone else. And Lord, you did that. The righteous for the unrighteous. The just for the unjust. So that we too might taste that, uh, that goodness that you are. So Lord, we thank you for the blood that reminds us of the death of Jesus. And we're thankful for the body of Jesus, broken, bruised, killed on our behalf. Why don't we partake together? I love that one line of this song that says, our God has robbed the grave. They didn't need to roll that stone away um, for Jesus to get out because ultimately as soon as the Lord raised him from the dead, that was it. He was gone from that place already. The tomb in a sense was open for us so that we could verify it. So brethren, if we do need to pray for you, if you would like someone to pray with you or for you, um, we'd love to be able to do that for you. If there's some other way that we can serve you, please let us know. Also, that, why don't I pray for you and um, pray God's blessing for the rest of your Sunday. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are good. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your truth. We pray that uh, you will bless your people here. Lord, would you strengthen their hearts and their faith? Let them not grow weary in doing good, but let them keep on fighting the good fight of faith so that they too may receive that crown of glory, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to all those who have longed and loved his appearing. So God, I want to pray your blessings over my brothers and sisters here. Father, you know the things they have needful of, and we pray that they would draw near to you with those hearts in full assurance of faith that you're able to give them grace and mercy in their times of need. So Lord, we thank you. We commit them to your grace. And we say, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.